Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in Proverbs here. Um, I do have uh, copies of our study. Now, we began this study a number of weeks ago. It is dealing with really sound doctrine, but specifically relating to biblical parenting. And uh, we've been spending some time looking at the principles of biblical parenting. And uh, we did not complete the one that we're looking at right now, but I wanted to just kind of recap just a little bit before we get into this one once again. It is perhaps one of the hot topics when it comes to biblical parenting. The one that uh, many times we wonder, you know, is this really what the Bible teaches? But uh, there were several things that we've already covered when it comes to raising our children, the next generation. The reason, of course, why we are pursuing this, regardless of our marital status, regardless of whether we have children in the home or have children at all, is because these principles really transcend all of that. They really go to the core of how a nation survives. Because a nation that fears God is going to be a strong nation. A nation that rejects God, ignores God, goes contrary to God and His laws is going to fail. And we've seen that throughout history. And we are seeing that even in our country today. And one of the things that has been a tremendous burden upon my heart has been the view that Christian families in fundamental churches are witnessing an extremely high rate of attrition within their own homes. That children that were raised <clears throat> in an environment of church and appreciation for the Bible, and even <clears throat> introduced excuse me, <clears throat> to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, have <clears throat> in many cases turned their back upon the faith of their parents. In some cases, even bringing into the question, was that child ever truly born again? Sometimes we, sometimes we make assumptions. Uh, the assumption can be that of the child. The child says, well, I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, I went to church as a child. Yes, I'm a Christian. Well, Christianity is not inherited. It is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes even parents can make that assumption. We can begin to assume that, well, my child is born again, uh, they prayed a little prayer or something of that nature. One of the things that was a concern for Sharon and I as we were raising our children was that the Lord would reveal to us uh, continually that our children truly were children of God. We didn't want to assume anything. We didn't want to leave anything to chance, so to speak. We wanted to make sure that we were able to see in their life the fruit, the evidence that they were children of God so that as they grew, they would own the convictions own the doctrine that we had taught them in the home so that when they left, they would have those same principles guiding their lives. And, uh, and so why we are doing this is to really reinforce how important it is that we raise the next generation in what we call the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we spent some time with the, really the, the pulse of parenting, which is taken right there from the book of Ephesians chapter 6. That the pulse of parenting is raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And both of those words are disciplinary words. One deals with the verbal aspect, the other with largely the physical aspect. They are disciplinary words. And God is a God of discipline. Loving discipline, but yet discipline. Because it is not human nature to adhere to the laws of God. It is contrary to our sin nature. And when we come to Christ, we have the spiritual nature born within us, but we still have that fleshly nature. And they're at odds with each other. So we've been looking at the principles of parenting. The first three, I'll just simply share with you. And again, if there's anyone here that would like to have this curriculum, you say, hey, I, you know, I missed some of this, or I would like to refresh my memory, let me know, and I'd be happy to email you the full document, everything here. Uh, that we have on this. We'd be happy to do that. Uh, some have already mentioned that they would like that. I just need to remember to do that. But uh, the first principle of biblical parenting is to lay a solid foundation. And of course, that began with the notion of salvation, but it went beyond that. It went beyond that. It dealt with, for example, uh, family curses. If, uh, when we get married, 
uh, to, when two people get married, they bring their own heritage, their own past, their own experiences with them. A lot of that is good, and you build upon it, develop your own traditions, but sometimes it's not so good. There are certain things that I bring into the relationship that actually need to be removed so it doesn't continue to be passed down to the next generation. And so laying that solid foundation, and we're not going to go into all of that, but that is the first principle. The second principle we looked at weeks ago was to maintain consistent communication. Maintain consistent communication. And we looked at the detractors for communication. Why does communication often break down in the home? And we spent time looking at that. The third principle that we looked at was cultivate godly character. Cultivate godly character and how to go about uh, within the life of our child or children, uh, cultivate that godly character. And we use the biblical template that God Himself used with His own children, Adam and Eve, uh, in the garden. So we spent some time looking at that. Now, this fourth principle where we left off a couple weeks ago is administer loving discipline. Administer loving discipline. Discipline, and we looked at a series of scriptures. Um, they're actually in the notes, if uh, if you would like to have that. But I'm going to uh, read some scriptures here that relate to loving discipline. In Proverbs 13, verse 24, "He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes." Proverbs 20, verse 30, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Proverbs 22, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. And then Proverbs 29.15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And as we got into this particular lesson, we first looked at the must, if you will, of loving discipline. There must be loving discipline in the home. The Scriptures are very clear that this is a critical aspect of raising children you remove discipline then that child is left to raise themselves and they will bring their father and their mother nothing but heartache and could in the end have a life of tragedy which may end up if that child is not regenerate in hell then we looked at the method of loving discipline the method of loving discipline and there were several aspects that we looked at for that real quickly. First, it is important that the parent make the expectations clear. Make expectations clear. We have observed that we should never expect what we do not inspect, but we should also never inspect what we do not expect. And so the child should be made very clear to the understanding of what the ground rules are uh, when we're raising them. Secondly, we are to remove any spirit of anger. Anger and parental discipline do not go together. Okay, As we've said before, angry parents raise angry children. And it may not be physically demonstrated, it could be just a spirit of anger that is just kind of percolating under the surface where the child senses the angry parent. Well, that anger is not going to bode well in raising a child. Anger does not have a place in the home. As We, we spent time on this when we were talking about uh, cultivating uh, or consistent communication. Because anger is a, it torpedoes good communication. And we're not going to go into that again because it's rather extensive but just suffice it to say anger has a purpose but not what the world often views as the purpose it simply lets us know something needs to be arranged or something needs to be dealt with and you deal with it in love um, 
not in anger. Uh, the third thing, we need to remain consistent. This is also something that's a problem. When a parent is inconsistent in their discipline, one day they are very much engaged and they deal with certain things. The other days they just kind of let things go by, they don't pay attention, and then the child is never really sure what those boundary lines are because mom and dad aren't necessarily consistent in how they are disciplining their children. Number four, match the discipline to the infraction. This can be connected to anger. Um, when I am angry, I tend to lose control of my attitude and my actions, and sometimes I will blow up. And then when I'm not angry, the same infraction gets a completely different response. Um, but to match the discipline to the infraction. Not every infraction requires a particular type of discipline. Uh, and so the parents need to work together on what those disciplinary measures are to be for specific infractions. Again, we're not going to go into all of this again. We spent time on this a couple weeks ago. Number five, affirm love for the child. Discipline is about love. That's how God disciplines us. We're told that in Hebrews chapter 12. He disciplines us because He loves us. He wants us to grow upright. <clears throat> Parents need to make sure that you remove anger and you replace it with a definite, affirming sense of love for that child. And that they have no question that you are doing this, not because you want to, but because you must do it. And it is done in love. And we have scriptures for all of these again. And then finally, uh, to leave it and move on. Um, you don't let it linger. You know, you don't discipline a child and then you bring it up and say, you know, I hope you never do that again. Well, it was dealt with. It was over. So you move on. You don't need to bring that back up again with the child. So now we come to the last aspect, which we have not covered yet. And that is the manner of discipline <clears throat> the manner of discipline and scriptures give us a clear indication what discipline particularly when we talk about corporal discipline that's really what we're focusing on here corporal punishment if you will corporal discipline the physical aspect of discipline again not every infraction requires some physical discipline uh, but nevertheless it is something that parents may need to exercise. I know that the world has a completely different view on discipline, which is really ultimately non-discipline. Uh, and there's a reason for it. There's a reason why the philosophy swirling about over ra raising children deviate tremendously from the Scriptures. Because the world does not want children raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They want children that are unruly and rebellious and disrespectful. And so they encourage philosophies and methodology that encourage disobedience and disrespect, not living a Christ-honoring, character-filled life. And so the manner of discipline is going to be important here. Uh, the manner in which parents engage their children in discipline, uh, it's going to vary <clears throat> based upon age and infraction. We have five children. Uh, we only have one still in the home. We do not treat Lorraine like we like now. She's 20 years old. We don't treat her like we did when she was 2 or 12 uh, we treat her differently and we understand that there is maturation levels and expectations, but the goal is to apply the discipline while they are young so that as they grow, the need for severe disciplinary action becomes less and less. Sometimes turning things around if things have gotten out of control uh, becomes a challenge. It can be done but it becomes a challenge, and sometimes the methodology has to change a little bit uh, simply because of age. And of course, we talk about the infraction itself, what is being done, what, is, what sin has been committed. 
Sometimes the discipline may require simply a stern rebuke or just a heart-to-heart talk like the the proverbial lecture. Uh, At other times, the discipline may take the form of sanctions or loss of privileges. And in some cases, for the more egregious offenses, discipline may result in corporal punishment. It is this manner of discipline that requires the greatest care as it inflicts physical pain upon the child. So there's some important observations regarding corporal punishment that we want to look at here because this is where sometimes parents slip from discipline into abuse. And many times there's a fine line there. So how do we know we are disciplining that child, not abusing that child? Maybe we have seen examples of parents who have lost their temper and uh, that child has disobeyed maybe in a public place or something and that parent just starts wailing on that child. Um, that is abuse. Uh, we're going to get into some more of the details on that. And, uh, and so I'm not going to give a whole bunch of examples at this point, but just let's take a look at these one at a time. If you're taking notes, uh, the first, the first uh, observation that's very important is use the proper setting. Use the proper setting. Corporal discipline should never be administered in public. Even if the discipline must wait. And we talked about the hazards of delaying discipline, but sometimes it is necessary. Either we are need to compose ourselves, or we're in a public place. It is far better to settle it privately in the home uh, for a variety of reasons. Okay? From a psychological standpoint, the child does not need to be humiliated in public. Okay? You are going to increase the resentment, the bitterness, and the anger of that child when they are humiliated in public. You don't need that. But you also invite potential problems being reported by some person watching this. And you could create more issues for yourself. This is not a public spectacle. This is something that is private between the parent and and the child. So the proper setting is going to be important. Um, <clears throat> when we were raising our children, and they're by no means perfect because we are not perfect, but Sharon and I understood that there are certain places, venues, that we could not discipline our children. So our goal was to make it very clear to our children that just a look or a simple word was all it would take for them to realize that if you continue to push, When we get home, there will be consequences. And, uh, you know, again, our children are not perfect. They never were. We aren't perfect parents. We never were. But we understood that you simply don't do certain things in public. You draw attention to the situation, uh, (coughs) which can humiliate the child, but also can put you in legal problems, uh, which you don't need. We don't need that. Uh, The state does not know how to raise children but it will try to tell you how to raise your children. It's best not to get yourself engaged in that. But that's just one one aspect of biblical discipline. You find the proper setting for it. It needs to be done privately where you, and, and this would also include not doing it in front of the siblings if they're siblings. To make a, an example of Johnny in front of little Sally, uh, See, see what Johnny's getting? You better not or you're going to get the same thing. That's not how we communicate biblical discipline. Proper setting is one of privacy. The second is the proper medium. The Scriptures are clear that the proper medium for administering corporal punishment is the rod. It never makes reference when raising children to a whip to a belt, to a strap, to one's hand. It makes reference to the rod. And there's a reason for this. Parents should never use their hand because that then sends mixed signals. The hand is for loving and embracing. 
caressing, not for striking a child. I'll just give you, <clears throat> I'll just give you a, um, a simple example that has nothing to do with disciplining a child. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, my daughter had a, uh, when she had an apartment, she, they had a dog. Uh, and the dog was a rescue dog, a beautiful dog. Um, but it was obvious that that dog had been abused by previous owners. We didn't really know it at the time, <clears throat> but when I would take the dog for a walk, the dog was always very mild-mannered and very tentative, very timid. And she was a large, she was a, 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 um, a, a husky Australian Shepherd mix, just a really beautiful animal. And uh, I remember one time when the, she had bent down to s sniff something, and then she was going to, it is this, I said, Freya, no. And I reached down to kind of, and she, she immediately, like, like I was going to hit her. Well, I wasn't going to hit her. And that was not uncommon whenever we'd raise the hand maybe to do something. If she wasn't sure what we we're going to do, she immediately recoiled because she was used to being struck so often that that hand meant, I'm going to get hit. And parents should never have the sense, or the children should never have the sense that as soon as you raise your hand, I'm going to get slapped. I'm going to get smacked with the hand. The hand is not for smacking a child. It is for loving a child. A belt or some flexible item is also not good because it lacks control. It doesn't have a rigidity to it, so it lacks control. You cannot put it necessarily where you really want to put it. And there is a special place where it needs to be put. And so you need to make sure that it goes where it's supposed to be going. And so the rod is referred to in Scripture um, the belt, because it is flexible, lacks that control. Only a rod or a paddle of some kind can be directed with the proper control and precision and with sufficient force. Again, something elastic like that is difficult to necessarily gauge the force of the blow. You might be swinging, but you don't necessarily know how that is going to impact the child because there is no rigidity to it. And so this gives us better control where we are striking the child and how firmly and hard we are striking the child. The third thing that is important is to use the proper parent. The proper parent. Administering corporal punishment to a son or daughter will require a degree of propriety. When children are very young, either parent may spank the child. But as they mature, it is appropriate for fathers to discipline their sons and mothers, uh, to, for, to, for fathers to discipline their sons and mothers to discipline their daughters. As our children, we have four girls and one boy. And so as Ethan would get older, um, that was largely my responsibility for carrying out discipline for Ethan. As our girls got older, eventually it all became Sharon's responsibility for physically disciplining our, our daughters, it, the daughters. It was it was just a matter of propriety and what was appropriate, uh, and and so that is important when it comes to uh, biblical discipline using the proper parent. Uh, number four, using the proper place. <clears throat> God has provided one place upon every human being where a rod can be directed without causing internal trauma or lasting damage. And we all know where that is. The seat of correction. Right here. Um, under no circumstances should a parent strike a child in any other place. A child should never be slapped in the face, beat on the head. They should never be struck on the legs or in the stomach or any other place where damage could result. We're not trying to hurt a child in the sense of damaging them. We're trying to inflict sufficient pain to get the message across. And God gave us all a place on our body that can take a, a strike without leaving internal damage uh, 
or in, in some way um, trauma to internal organs or the body itself. Uh, and so uh, there's going to be the blueness of the wound. The Bible speaks of that. There's going to be bruising, well, possibly, but that will eventually subside and go away. Uh, whereas certain other scars that can be given to a face or other parts of the body may not go away. And, and that's not the objective in the first place of biblical discipline. So use the proper place. And then finally, use the proper force. The proper force. The purpose of all discipline, including corporal punishment, is to correct both the attitude and the actions of a child. Not provide a channel for parents to vent their frustration or anger. That's not what discipline is about. It's not an outlet. I'm angry and you're going to feel it. That's not discipline. That is abuse. And quite frankly, it can be abuse regardless of the force. Say, well, I hardly touched him. You still abused him. Because you did it in the wrong spirit, in the wrong way. Even when a parent verbally disciplines a child through ridicule, mockery, sarcasm, that is abuse. That serves no purpose. That produces anger in the child, resentment in the child. That is not discipline. God does not treat us that way. We should not treat our children that way. So let's not first think, well, abuse is about force, and if I hit them too hard, is that, that's no, no. Abuse can be completely aside from physical discipline. All discipline, especially corporal punishment, should be measured very carefully. The rod will doubtless bring pain to a child. Gauging the level of pain to accomplish the desired end is critical. Parents should never beat their child repeatedly to get their attention, but use deliberate blows equal to the occasion. I cannot put in a box or some sort of cookie cutter, this is what you do in this situation, this is what you do in that situation, this is how many you have for that, and this and the other thing. We can't do that. Because every infraction is different. The spirit in which that infraction occurred is different. The degree of understanding of the child is different. All of these factors and more play into the age of the child. All of this plays into this. So I can't give you a, you know, a number of this or a number of that or how you do this. It is simply between you and the Lord as to how you're going to administer that discipline. More than a half dozen strokes should seldom, if ever, in my mind, be required. Now the Bible didn't give us a number. Now it does talk about you know, prisoners, you know, 40 strokes save one and things of that nature. And that was more of a legal, uh, legal requirement uh, that was established. But the Bible, when it talks about disciplining children, does not go into the number of strokes. It doesn't tell you, parents, you should never use this much or you should always use at least this much. It doesn't say that. It doesn't give that. I'm just, from my personal opinion, if it's done properly and the child has been raised already with the understanding, I, I can't see that going much more than half a dozen. Again, that's my opinion, and you can take it for what it's worth, uh, but um, that would be at least a, a, a good gauge. Uh, remember, while administering corporal punishment, too many strokes can turn an act of discipline into an act of abuse. Um, <clears throat> Discipline is to get the attention and get the action corrected. And if you continue to go and the child has understood, then you have just moved from discipline into abuse. Administering loving discipline is a crucial facet of biblical parenting. The world does not have the answers when it comes to raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We understand that. Only the Bible can provide an effective foundation for proper discipline. And we ask ourselves this, parent, are we stepping up to the plate in this area of family life? Have we established the clear consequences based upon definite instruction for our children? 
If so, we will reap the blessing of seeing our children grow and mature as God intended. One other thought here before we finish. The difference between discipline and punishment. We often term it corporal punishment, but I prefer the term corporal discipline. Okay, And there's a reason why. The world has confused these two thoughts. Discipline relates to instruction which is intended to bring understanding and correction. It is a method of teaching. Discipline relates to teaching. It's an instructive tool. Punishment, on their hand, is a consequence for transgression of instruction. It is a byproduct of accountability. Punish it, punishment can be instructive, but its true force is as a deterrent for misbehavior. And so, yes, there is punishment that follows, but really the spirit in which it is administered is disciplinary. I'm trying to correct a situation. <coughs> Excuse me. And that child can then reflect upon what took place and say, I don't want that punishment again. I don't want to go through that again. And so um, there is a difference between the two. Discipline is instructive. It is te about teaching. Punishment is more consequential. Okay, It's a byproduct of accountability. You did this, well, here's the consequence. This is the punishment for that. You're speeding down the road. The speed limit is 25 and you're doing 40. And you get a ticket. That is punishment. Okay, but it can be instructive too. So the next time you hit that spot, you say, okay, slow down, slow down. There, is, there are certain places in the past that I have been caught without realizing what I've been doing, truly. And then now I see that, I say, oh, I, oh, oh slow down. Yeah, gotta, don't, don't want that again. Don't want that again. Uh, and so, uh, so, but there is a difference between the two. We're going to close with this. And again, if there's anybody that has... Uh, any questions, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. Uh, or if you'd like to get this material uh, to kind of get up to speed and look at it for yourself, let me know and I'd be happy to send that to you also. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for its clarity. And pray, Lord, that you would continue to raise up another generation of God-fearing young people. And Father, that you would use the godly efforts of godly parents to bring about just such a thing. And we pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.